want you to go with me to Mark's Gospel, the St. Mark's Gospel, chapter 6. I want us to begin with the 46th verse. You know, this is a, this is a very interesting passage because I believe that it really is a parallel, if you will, to what we see this time of year. If, if you don't notice, or if you haven't noticed by now, on the weather reports and our national, even international media coverage, we are entering the time of year where many storms and tornadoes and hurricanes take place because of different and changing weather patterns. Temperatures rising, humidity uh, nearing 100%. And we'll hear a lot about these kinds of storms that take place in America, across the waters, and even in other countries. Some will be very devastating. In fact, some we've heard as just recently in the state of Texas, where tornadoes and floodings have devastated several lives, taken several lives. And obviously, it's always a tragedy when lives are taken or tragedies like this take place we try to recover we try to recoup we ask the lord to help us but it's very common for this time of year for these things to happen and we need to pray that god's hand will be upon people this passage here speaks of a time really when the lord had just been with a multitude of people he had been with the disciples in fact he had his disciples to help people or help him to serve people, to help people. And earlier in this chapter, the Bible reveals, at least in, in this account, particularly in St. Mark, he shares that about 5,000 men were fed. Now, we call this the feeding of the 5,000 because that's what the Bible says. But remember, the Bible says of about 5,000 men. So I picture not only men were served, after the food was multiplied, but obviously there had to have been women and children and families there. So there was probably several more thousand that were fed. But the Bible describes in Mark's account 5,000. And what had happened here is there, were, there was a, a, a great miracle that took place. God had multiplied through the miracle working of his hand so people can be fed. And so we pick up on this passage now. As it says, beginning in verse 46 of Mark 6. After telling everyone goodbye, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Now this is Christ. Late that night, the disciples were in their boat in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was alone on land. He saw that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard, rowing hard and struggling against the wind and waves. About 3 o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. He intended to go past them, but when they saw him walking on the water, they cried out in terror, thinking he was a ghost. They were all terrified when they saw him. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I am here. Then he climbed into the boat, and the wind stopped. They were totally amazed, for they still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves. Their hearts were too hard to take it in. Now Martin Luther said this. Several years ago he quoted, The human heart is like a ship on a stormy sea driven about by winds blowing from all four corners of heaven. It is really safe to say that in life we all go through storms. And there's even moments that we experience dark nights. Every one of us will have seasons where we will face the storms of life, where it seems like things around us are raging. But then there'll be other times that we will experience those moments at night where it's dark, we feel alone, we kind of get afraid of what's happening around us in our life. I find it remarkable how the Lord can seem to lead and steer our life when we are going through these times. It's often said, in fact, I've said it, and I think I've heard some of you say it, and I think it's, I think it's worthy to say that when families 
or an individual are going through real storms or dark times in their life and they do not have the Lord, how do they survive? I've often wondered when people are in the hospital and someone is getting ready, prepared for surgery and and, and someone has faced a, a real tragic accident and it may seem like to the family by what the doctors have shared that there's not much hope. I've often wondered, how does that individual, how do those family members get through moments like this when there's no mention of Christ, when there's no mention of the Holy Spirit, when there's no mention of God? I don't know how they do that. But I do know this, because God is who He is and who He says He is. And because he's given his son Jesus on our behalf, when we go through storms and when we go through those dark moments at night, the Lord is with us. I feel his presence when he's with us, don't you? Even when I'm by myself and I might be going through a storm or a dark time, we know that the Spirit of the Lord carries us. And the Bible gives us a wonderful story here of what has occurred. Now, again, it begins telling us something miraculous, something that we all would rejoice, just like the disciples did, about the people that were fed by Christ. He he made a miracle happen. But as soon as they fed the 5,000 plus, the Bible talks about that Jesus, he withdrew to the top of the mountain to pray. And from the, the mountainside, probably where he typically went, He looked out over the sea and and he could view the disciples because he instructed them, get in the boat and go across the lake and go over to Bethsaida. He had given them those instructions and they did what he asked them to do. And Jesus could even see the disciples straining because all of a sudden, it was night of course, and the storms and the winds begin to blow and the waves were becoming higher and I don't know how large or small that boat was that the disciples were in, but I think the history will show us it wasn't a very large vessel for them to be in. More like a fisherman's boat, boat I would imagine. And when the winds begin to blow and the storms become over that night, I don't know if you've ever been out on the lake, out on Lake Erie when it's nighttime. It's kind of a scary experience. I've been out there before, not in the midst of a storm, but in the midst of the nighttime. And it's a little scary if you can't really see around you. And this is what the disciples were experiencing. And Jesus saw what they were experiencing. And you know, when you and I go through experiences and Christ can see everything we're going to, our natural thinking is... God's going to get me out of this. God's going to help. He's going to pull me through. He's going to get me out of these deep waters. He's going to help me get through this dark night. But in this account, as Christ views his disciples in trouble, straining with their oars, he does nothing momentarily. And there's a purpose for that. He could have got them out of their problems. And it all would have been resolved. But sometimes Jesus chooses to let us strain at the oars. There's a purpose in this. There's a reason why at times he permits us to strain and go through difficulty. Because it's often in those struggles when we're straining with the oars that we discover a little bit more about who Jesus is. It's kind of like when you raise your little children, right? You don't get them out of every little problem and every little predicament. Because if you did that as a parent, that child will never learn how to grow on their own. If you did everything for them, when they got into a little bit of a struggle or a little bit of a challenge, they would have a difficult time of learning the lessons of life. And so you permit them to fall or to fail at times. You know just the right time to pick them up when they fall down. You know just at the right time to give them instruction when they need that instruction. And I can assure you today that Jesus knows exactly when you and I fall down. He knows when to extend his hand to pick us up. 
He knows an encouraging word to give us at the time that we're discouraged the most. He knows when we're straining, and he knows what to do about it. The text never really tells us why Jesus did it this way, why he seemed to pretend to just pass them by. But maybe it's because Jesus will only get in our boat when we ask him to. He's always available, but do we ask him to help us when we are in time of need? Do we call upon him? And so he immediately speaks to them. And he says it in real simple terms. He says, listen, disciples, take courage. It is I. You don't have to be afraid. That right there would be enough promise for us to walk out today and declare victorious lifting. Li- lifting. When, when God looks down at us and he reveals something to us and says, listen, my child, take courage. Be lifted up. It is I. I'm keeping you. Don't be afraid. And there's a difference when we understand when the Lord is keeping us in his arms and keeping us in his care. We don't have to be afraid, do we? We can take courage because we know when it is him, all fear is gone. All anxiety is gone. All the trouble seems to fade away and it seems like the storms are removed. The Bible says that when he said this, instantly the wind died down. They were completely amazed. One translation talks about how they were stunned. They were shocked. (laughs) And they were speechless, really. The text that talks about their stunned because their hearts were hard. And so somewhere along the way, they had to lose their focus. Remember, just moments earlier, they were with the multitudes and they witnessed a miracle that Jesus gave those people to feed them. And now some time passes by. They're in the middle of the night and their hearts are hardened. They couldn't realize that the Lord was with them. Here was the problem. And this is what happens with us sometimes. We get involved and get engrossed in what's happening that we lose sight and we lose focus of the one who made it happen the disciples saw the baskets full they saw all the food that was there and distributed and they weren't all they were probably hungry they took part in themselves as well as serving but they somehow forgot the one who made it happen they were enthusiastic about the miracle but they lost sight of the miracle worker and in good times when bread is multiplied it's easy for us to focus on the blessing and lose sight of the blesser we all the time want to talk about miracles or get excited about miracles and when they happen but have we remembered who the miracle worker is The one who gives the miracle. Earlier we were speaking about salvation and we were speaking about communion. And did you know that the greatest miracle that can happen for you and I is not a great physical healing. It's not getting a good job. It's not landing an inheritance. A great miracle is what happens to us is when we receive the grace of God in our hearts and we become a believer in Christ Jesus. That's the greatest miracle that takes place, and we rejoice each day in that miracle. How can we do that? Because of the one that gave us the miracle, the one that gave us this gift of salvation, Jesus Christ alone. But the disciples somehow lost that. And in the worst of times, their focus was the storm. There they were in this little boat out in the middle of the sea. And they feared for their life and they feared that they were drowning. The disciples were consumed with the reality of their present circumstances. And they had lost their focus, namely Jesus. 
This whole account deals with this one very fact. The whole text is about Jesus himself. Everything centers, points, and focuses on Jesus himself. Not the miracle, not the way he appeared to them, but really who he is. And in good times and bad times, in the storms, in the moments of loneliness, this is what he expresses to us every time, even when we don't recognize who he is. This is what he says to you and me. It is I. Don't be afraid. And that's what he's saying here today. Rose Kennedy said, birds sing after storms. Why shouldn't people? And so we gain several insights of this text and of this account. I want to give them to you today. The first one talks about when we cannot see Jesus, he sees us. Because he's at the top of the mountain. He's always praying. He's always watching. He's always concerned. And when you can't see Jesus, even in darkness, be assured that he can see you and me. There's times where we forget about Jesus because we don't think he's there. Somehow we want to get this visual image. But not all the time we can. We lose sight often. I'm talking spiritually. We lose spiritual sight of who Jesus is. But you can be assured of something today, church. Jesus sees you. And Jesus sees me. And even when I get off course sometimes, and and you kind of lose it sometimes, he still sees us. That's why we must come back and repent to him. When we've walked away from him, when we've lost sight of who he is, he doesn't lose sight of us. He sees us. And then secondly, when you can't get to Jesus, he eventually gets to you. Because he's not always up in the mountain, but he comes down from that mountain. And he comes down to where we are. He walks down to where we are in the lake. He steps into the waves and and he walks on the water to get to us. And he comes to us by praying for us in heaven. How do we know that? Well, this is what the Bible tells us. Paul said in Romans 8 and 34, Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he's sitting in the place of honor of God's right hand pleading for us. And we lose sight of that sometimes, that the Lord is ready and he's prepared to meet our needs. He's not dead today. We know that through history, through the event, through what the Bible, through what the Spirit verifies in our spirit. That after three days, he arose out of the tomb and he made himself known to the disciples. He made himself known, the Bible says, to about 500 people. And he was lifted up into heaven. And there and today, he sits at the right hand of the Father. He serves as as an advocate for us. He serves as an in-between. So every time I come to God, Jesus is there as an advocate on my behalf. And he says, what is it that you have need of today, my son? What is it you have need of today, my daughter? Give me your need, and I'm going to present it to my Father. And his will will be done to be accomplished. Why does he do that? Because he cares. And because he loves you. The Lord doesn't just save us and then forget about us. No, that he saves us, and then we begin a journey of discovering who he is. And so you see, when you cannot get to Jesus, he eventually gets to you. He comforts us on earth by the Holy Spirit. This is what he was revealing in John chapter 14, beginning in the 16th verse. When he said, I will ask of the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him. He's speaking to the believers. He's speaking to the church. 
because he lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Listen, he's reigning in heaven. And because he's reigning in heaven, we can have victorious living in our own life because he reigns in our heart. That's why he gave the Holy Spirit to bring a comfort to us, to bring a strength to us, to help us in time. That's what he told the disciples to do. He said, I'm going to be leaving you. I'm exiting. But there's going to be one who is called the comforter to bring strength to you, to bring guidance to your life, to bring a, a help to you. He gives the Holy Spirit, which leads us into all truth. And then thirdly, when I don't know what to say to Jesus, he speaks to me. Because <laughs> sometimes I don't know what to say to the Lord. Do you? Do you know what to say to the Lord all the time? We get troubled in that. And even when we're not sure what to say, and we, like the disciples, become afraid, he says, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Because there are times you don't even know what to pray. Have you been there before? I've been there many times. I knew it was a time to pray. And it may be an emergency. But even in the time of emergency, I didn't know what words to say. I knew how I felt. I just didn't know how to express it. And sometimes we become lost in that. I think I might have shared this before, but I'll share it right here. You want to know some of my most deepest, intense prayers being offered up to God has been at times? It's been something like this. Help! I've called out to God that way. One word with a plea and a cry from the heart. Help! And do you know that he has heard that prayer? Because I may not have known what to say, but he certainly knows what's in my spirit. I may not know how to, how to give it out, how to, how to bring it at a form of an utterance, but he certainly knew my cry. He knew my soul. Sister Kim, we may not know what to say when we get up in front of people, but we certainly know that God understands our heart, and he understands our language, and he understands our spirit. What a saving Christ we have today because he knows what to do in our time of need, even when I don't know what to pray. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to say it. But he certainly receives my heart. How do we develop this kind of courage before the Lord? Well, we have to verbalize his truth. And the Bible helps us with that in Hebrews chapter 13. One of my favorite passages. The Bible says, for he himself has said, I love this. If you ever get lost out on the seas of life, if you feel like you're in a place where it's as dark as the night, just remember these words of what Jesus utters here in this verse 5 of Hebrews 13. He says, I will never leave you. You ever have anybody that's been in your life and one day they leave? never to return he says I will never leave you he says I will never forsake you in other words what I have told you is truth is going to be truth what I have told you to be assured of through my word through my presence through my spirit you can count on it I will never leave you I will never forsake you and so we may boldly say the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. And the writer concludes there in verse 6, what can man do to me? That reminds me of another verse that says, if God is for me, who can be against me? I think that's what you shared earlier. God is for me, who cares? If the world is against me, Jesus is for me. 
<laughs> Though none go with me, still I'm going to follow the Lord. Amen? Why? Because I've decided to follow Jesus. I've decided to make him Lord of my life. I've decided that I'm going to follow his presence and his spirit. Oh, what wonderful victory we gain when we hear him say, take courage. It is I. You don't have to be afraid. He's talking about with anything in life. We don't have to worry. We don't have to be afraid. And what can man do to you and me? Several years ago, well, this was many years ago, back in the 18th century, long about 1793, there was a family by the name of Bill and Dorothy Carey. They had four children, and they had set out to voyage, and they were on what was called the Princess Maria, and they had set sail to go over to India. And this journey took about five months. And as they set out, everything was going fine for the first few days. But then the, cloud, the, the, the clouds started forming in the sky. There was blue sky when they began. But all of a sudden, within minutes, a cloud began to overcast that ocean where they were. And the next thing they knew, they came across stormy waters. Now at the time... Bill was asleep. He was resting. But because of the fierce storm and the winds, obviously it, it broke glass. It, it began to move pots and pans and things that were in the, that ship that they were on. And it woke him up. And he goes on to talk about how the fierce storms and winds just kept blowing and kept moving the vessel. And he even goes on to say it at one moment, that the ship had turned almost perpendicularly and they thought they were going to go under but then the wave would come and turn the ship back and this was a constant movement of what was taking place they were fearing for their lives obviously but the storm had settled down they got through that but in a few moments another storm came up isn't that the way our life is oftentimes a raging wind and a storm comes in our life and we don't know how we're going to get through it and we cry out to God and we ask the Lord to help us in our time of need and, and he does and we get through and the water's calm and just about the time we're ready to take a deep breath here comes another it's just the way the seasons of life seem to go but after they got through all that survival and they made the place to their destination this is what Bill Carey later wrote about it. He said this, he said, I hope I have learned the necessity of bearing up in the things of God against wind and tide. When there is occasion, as we have done in our voyage, in the Christian life, he says, we often have to work against wind and tide, but we must do it if we expect ever to make port and that's what happens when we go through the storms of life it becomes a course of bearing against the wind and the tide we go through the places of deep waters we experience the dark nights and how do we survive that how do we overcome those moments well we got to simply know that Jesus sees exactly where we're at you know we act sometimes when we're going through a real trouble time or we're going through a real troublesome valley we act as though sometimes that the Lord has no awareness of where we're at oh yes he does He's been on a mountain. He's been praying. He's looking to see our every need. He's looking to see our every battle. But like I said earlier about our children, if he stuck out a life preserver for us every time we went through something, would we ever really learn? If 
he rescued us each time. There's moments that we've got to strain with the oars. And there's times that our life has to face the rough and raging waters so we can trust God. There's moments you and I have faced where we feel like we're about to drown. We're about to go under. I don't know if you've ever experienced that event where you've nearly drowned. As an eight-year-old boy, I had that terrible experience. I thought I was drowning. I was underwater. The water was way over my head. You'd have thought that it made me fearful of water the rest of my life. I'm thankful that it wasn't, but I had to overcome that fear. It didn't happen overnight. It was through a process. But as an eight-year-old boy, just rolling underwater, not knowing how I was going to come out of this, it was a man that was right there, and he took his arms, and he undergirded me, and he lifted me up out of the water to safety. That's what Jesus does when we go through those times we feel like we're drowning in life. We feel like we are facing those dark nights of missed opportunities. Jesus appears and he steps out on the waters of our life and as we look and we don't know exactly who it is at first, he utters, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Would you stand please? When I can't see him, he sees me. And when you can't see him, he sees you. When you can't get to him, he will get to you. When you don't even know what to say, he will speak to us. He will speak into my life, he will speak into your life, and he will guide us safely. Why? Because of his promise to us through his word. I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm going to be with you all the way to the end. That was his promise to us. And I am a personal witness. I can give personal testimony. He has kept his word. Times that I was drowning, I need to call on him. There he was. That let me know he didn't leave. Times that I had forsaken him, yet he did not forsake me. And when he said, I'm going to be with you all the way to the end, he was telling me and he was telling you and he was telling us that when we would face most treacherous moments of life, and we feel like our life is out on the sea and the winds are blowing and it's storming and it looks like there is no hope for us. He stands in the midst of it with the assurance of reminding us to take courage. In other words, don't forget about me. You see, if the disciples had to really saw what miracle was taking place, it wasn't about the food that was provided. It was about the miracle worker right in their midst. And that's the view we've got to get. Their hearts would not have been hardened. They would have not became fearful had they had their heart and spirit prepared right before the Lord. And oftentimes, we lose sight of where the Lord is. We lose sight of where He is moving where he has gone because we've got our mind back on here and what he did yesterday or what he did back here when miracles happen we can rejoice we can be thankful but we've got to move on and follow the miracle worker and let him lead our lives because he constantly reminds us that we can take courage in him not to be afraid he is with us 
And if God is for us, who can be against us? He cares for you and he cares for me. Would you bow your head, please? I want us to pray in just a moment here. And I wonder how many people today are fighting through the storms of life and you feel like you're on the middle of the sea in a small vessel and the winds and the storms are raging and it's hard for you to take courage. Maybe there's others here that feel like you're just in a dark night somewhere that you're lost. You don't see any light around you. Listen, the Lord is saying, take courage. Don't be afraid. He's acknowledging himself to you. If you're going through storms, if you're experiencing dark nights, or if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I'm going to ask you to come and make your way to the front of this altar. And we're going to pray with you. And we're going to ask God to cover you and to speak into your life because he's been watching where you're at. He knows exactly where you've been. He knows exactly how far you might have drifted. But he knows today that he wants to make himself known. He wants to do like he did with the disciples. Climb back in the boat. And did you notice the scripture text? When he got in the boat immediately, they were at ease. That fear left them. They recognized who he was. And that's what happens when we bring Jesus into our life. We don't have to be afraid. We recognize who he is. And he brings peace into our life. And that's what people are looking for today. The peace of Jesus. So I'm going to ask you to come. If you're going through storms, you're going through a dark night, you need Jesus into your heart. You need Jesus in your life. Would you come today? We want to pray with you.